Get ready! Video game movies are... Well, they're awful. Super Mario Brothers, Mortal Kombat, Tomb Raider... They made another Tomb Raider? Have we learned nothing? But would you believe me if I said there was actually a movie based on a video game series that not only was good by those standards, but was also just a really good movie? Don't believe me? Well, too bad, because Professor Layton and the Eternal Diva exists, and I'm here to tell you about it. Because nobody frickin' talks about the good stuff. If you've never played a Professor Layton game before, they're definitely worth your time if you like puzzle games. It's a series of puzzle games exclusive to the DS family of consoles revolving around the title character solving mysteries and lots and lots of puzzles and riddles. Hundreds of them. The movie begins by showing Professor Layton in action, solving a mystery in a clock tower. After he explains the solution to a problem we never knew about, it opens up and they chase a villain named Don Paolo. We also see a recurring character from the games named Flora. Luke! Right! Flora, you stay here. <laughs> Professor? That was the only time we see her for this whole movie. After Don Paolo gets away, his assistant... I am his apprentice! Fine, apprentice tells us about how cool the professor is, and oh my gosh, Winter Layton is adorable. After informing the audience who might not know about the characters, Luke and Layton set up the story with a flashback to three years ago. Janice Quatlane, a former student of the professor's, invites the duo to an opera she's performing in. She explains in a letter how her friend, Melina Whistler, died the previous year and somehow reappeared in the form of a young girl, claiming to have been given eternal life. The opera tells the story of Ambrosia, an ancient civilization that supposedly discovered an elixir for eternal life to cure their dying queen. It didn't work. She died. Now the kingdom is pretty much something that might not even exist, but is sought after by those who believe in it. Also, Professor informs Luke about the giant contraption known as the Detrigan, which the composer, Oswald Whistler, is using to play all the music. Once the opera ends, a mysterious masked man appears on stage and says one person will receive the gift of eternal life. Gift of eternal life? Yes, Luke. The gift of eternal life. However, he's not just going to decide by lottery or pulling someone's name out of a hat. In order to win the prize, the audience must play a game where they risk their lives in a series of challenges. Several people try to escape and fall through trap doors while the professor goes to confront wannabe Jigsaw. But before he can, he's beaten to the punch by... Fear not! I am Inspector Grosky of the Yard! This guy's the best, by the way. But it turns out the guy he's just arrested is a trap dun dun dun. As if that wasn't enough, the theater turns into a huge ship. It's really a huge ship! Yes, Luke. It is a huge ship. Floating out to sea. Which it turns out is infested with frickin' sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their frickin' heads. So now no one's getting away. Since they don't have the option to refuse anymore, the game begins with a puzzle. And this is probably the best aspect of the entire movie. The inclusion of puzzles as a central theme. This movie is based on a franchise known for including hundreds of brain teasers in each game. So having a few of its own makes it feel more like something that belongs in the Professor Layton franchise. There are only a handful throughout the entire movie, but they're incorporated well enough to not feel tacked on. One major complaint about video game movies is that they either rely too much on source material, or they don't follow it at all. But this movie manages to find that perfect middle ground. There aren't very many puzzles, in fact I would probably say there's less than 10 in the whole movie. But for how few there are, they're actually really interesting, and they give you enough time to solve it along with the characters. I won't be telling you the answers to the puzzles. I mean, I'll gladly just tell you what happens in the movie, but I'm gonna spoil the puzzles and give you the answer. The second puzzle has the 12 remaining characters head out on lifeboats, and when they solve it, this happens. Now this bizarrely advanced boat technology might seem strange if you've never played a Professor Layton game before. Machines like this are just another part of the world in this series. And then this happens. Uh, ahoy. Ahoy. Uh, where is everyone? They cannot hide from Inspector Grosky. Justice will prevail and I... I... Oh! oh. 
This is why every scene involving Inspector Grosky is gold. Back in London, the professor's assistant Emily is gathering clues on the disappearance of a young girl. This will come back into play soon, so remember it. In the morning, we rejoin the professor, and how did his hat stay on all night? The boat's taken to an island that used to be the location of Ambrosia, where their evil captors set up a picnic for them. Aww. What a thoughtful villain. Just as everyone starts to relax on the beach, the next challenge is announced. That's not a puzzle! After the professor blinds them with sand and runs away, they find the villain's impractically designed castle he borrowed from Soul Eater. Layden again solves the puzzle, defend them from the wolves, but then someone trips, and the wolves see them. Professor, they've seen us! Yes, Luke, the wolves see you. They run from the wolves until they find a shed, in the middle of jungle somehow, and the professor, he pretty much just goes full MacGyver. Again, this might seem weird, unless you've played a Professor Layton game before. He's made a coin shooting machine gun out of a slot machine, so why not a helicopter crafted from a chainsaw in a barrel? Thanks to the makeshift copter, they land at the villain's castle, where a mysterious figure watches them from security cameras. Calling all the remaining characters to the courtyard, another puzzle is presented to guide them to the next location. Professor, there are letters here. Yes, Luke. There are letters there. While Luke finds the correct answer, Leighton decides to go through another door to investigate. Luke and the others enter some kind of bedroom and are immediately trapped inside. Nice going, Luke. What are you even here for? Then the villain of the movie, the one who trapped everyone on the ship and threatened their lives, finally reveals himself. It's you! Yes, Luke, it's... Wait, who is this guy? I am Jean Discolet. Okay, good to know. This is probably the weakest part of the movie, actually. You see, this movie actually takes place between two games in the prequel series, The Last Spectre and Miracle Mask. The Last Spectre was the first appearance of Descolet as the primary antagonist of that trilogy. It was the only game he appeared in before this movie, so anyone who hasn't played it before watching this would have no idea who he is. His minions take away a young girl named Amelia, who was invited to the opera by Oswald Whistler. Meanwhile, Leighton discovers the room of Melina Whistler, where he encounters Melina. The... Uh, the, the, the seven-year-old Melina. She starts to get angry at Leighton before freaking out and beginning to talk with two very distinct voices. Let's get back to Luke and his group. They trick one of the guards and run down the hall where they encounter more guards and meet with Emmy. Emmy beats up the guards, Professor Layton arrives with Melina, and we go to see Descolet and Mr. Whistler are actually in cahoots this whole time. Just before he places some weird helmet on Amelia, Layton bursts in, ready to reveal the truth. And let me tell you... Oh... Okay, just... Hang with me on this, okay? It turns out the Detrigan is a machine Descolet built for Mr. Whistler to store Melina's memories and personality until he can find someone to copy them into, essentially reviving his daughter by killing someone else. He invited Amelia, believing she would be a successful vessel, and became desperate since the Detrigan could only hold her memories for so long, just as he tries to copy his daughter into Luke. Um... The machine is shut off, making it useless. It turns out it was Janice who stole the key at some point we didn't see and somehow is still on the other side of the room. Not only that, but the professor reveals she was actually Melina the whole time! Okay, so get this too. The real Janice suppressed her own personality so Melina could live on through her, but Melina decided she can't go on living this way. So, she invited the professor to help and somehow thought this would end in convincing her father to stop trying to copy her into other people. Okay? We all good on that? Cool. With all that information laid out, Descolet takes Janice, Melina, whatever, and reveals his own plot twist. Because everyone's revealing something right now. His real goal is to use the music notes on the Ambrosian Seal, known as A Song of the Stars. Of the Stars? Yes, Luke, A Song of the Stars. In combination with Melina singing A Song of the Sea, 
A Song of the Sea. Dang it, Layton, not you two. Anyway, he needs Janlina to sing the Song of the Sea while he plays a Song of the Stars, believing it to be the key in raising Ambrosia. The explanation is because Melina was the only one who knew the song, meaning Janice is the only person who can sing it. Okay. With no other option, Majanlinis performs the song. The ground shakes and Emmy chops the metal off a wolf's ear. However, the song fails and Descalay turns to Plan B. A giant robot. Yeah. A giant robot. Again, this might seem weird and out of nowhere. Unless you've played a Professor Layton game before. I'm not kidding. Giant robots are actually pretty common for endings in this series. I'm not sure why. Layton and Luke jump back in the helicopter from earlier and fly up to save Melina while Descale just goes ham on the island. Janice tries to stop Descale but is pushed off and somehow rolls all the way to the edge of the platform. Hanging for her life, Luke decides to go and help her on his own, and how is Layton's hat staying on during all of this? Luke finally does something useful by showing off his mad parkour skills and makes a leap toward Melina. Just as he's about to beat Gurren Lagann, Layton swoops in and takes the attack for him, causing the copter to explode. Professor! What kind of delivery was that? Luckily, Professor Layton is too awesome to be killed by explosions and fights Descale with a loose metal pipe. I would now like to point out that a British puzzle-solving archaeologist is having a sword fight on top of a giant robot. That's just... that's just where this movie is now. It doesn't last long as Descale does some mad flips and Layton approaches the Detrigan. He explains the Seal of Ambrosia actually holds three songs, and the reason it didn't work before is because only two of them were playing. Holding the seal upside down shows the Song of the Sun. Okay, good. No one repeated it that time. With all three songs performed by Leighton and Melina, the ocean begins to glow and Ambrosia rises once again. Furious about Leighton being right, Descale attacks and destroys the control panels, causing the robot to go haywire and destroy itself. Descale falls and our three heroes leap off the robot as it walks into the ocean, impaling itself on a pillar and exploding multiple times. Melina says goodbye to everyone and leaves Janice's body, thus passing on completely. The inspector places Mr. Whistler under arrest, but allows him to play one more song. Layton says everything can live on as long as we remember them, and then credits. Oh, okay, okay then. I guess the movie's over. Kind of abrupt, but there you go. That is Professor Layton and the Eternal Diva, a video game movie that is actually really dang good. You could say the animation is really simple, and there's a lot of CGI, but that just goes in line with the series it's based on. This entire movie feels like it was taken straight out of a Professor Layton game, just with about 200 or so puzzles removed. Even if someone has never played a single game in the franchise, I think they would still enjoy this as an animated adventure. It has everything you could want in one. Likeable characters, cool action, some kind of treasure hunt. It's the little touches like the puzzles and similar story elements to the game that really make it something special. Professor Layton and the Eternal Diva is more than just a great movie. It's a great video game movie, possibly the only one. That's why I wanted to talk about it. There are so many bad movies based on debatably good franchises. I don't know if many people think a good one can be made. But someone did make a good one, and it deserves to be talked about. Of course, it's not perfect. My only major issue is the voice acting can feel kind of stiff and forced in some point during the movie, especially early on, but not really anything beyond that. If you want to see a video game based movie done right, you should go watch this immediately. Who knows? Might even get you interested in the games. Well, that's all I've got to say this time. Thanks so much for watching. Whoever you are, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.